So the very first problem of the point is said that you will be given an integer n and you will have to choose three distinct numbers x, y, and z which are not divisible by three. That is written as that one of them are divisible by three. And the sum of these three numbers should be equal to one. So the problem is that you will be given an integer n. You have to choose three non-negatives distinct uh, integers x, y, and z such that none of them is divisible by 3. So none of them is divisible by 3. That is what we have been told in the problem. Uh, okay, sorry, non-negative, not non-negative, it is uh, positive. Though the answer would be same because even if you take non-negative, you still cannot pick up zero. So, yeah, according to problem, it should be positive. Uh, the intuition was simple for this problem, the intuition which I got, that let's say that if n is very large, then there can be only two cases, whether n is divisible by 3 or not divisible by 3. Right. There can be only two cases for n when n is too large. We are taking n is too large because uh, there can be some uh, corner cases when n is when n is small, but for n is but one n is too large, it would be simple. So if it is not divisible not divisible. Can I say that if I pick up something like 1, 2, and n minus 3, the three elements like this, then it would like neither this one, neither this one, neither this one. None of them would be divisible by 3. Can I say this? Yes, I can say this. Uh, this just randomly came up to my mind. And even if, if you just try to think a little, you will also get something like this in your mind that the first two elements are having the sum 3. So the other number would also be not divisible by 3. In the case when n is divisible by 3, you cannot pick up something like 1, 2, and n minus 3 because you don't want this to be divisible. So we want to have something like n minus 4 or n minus 5 here, right? Uh, basically, n minus 1 or n minus 2, something like that. So it should not be divisible by 3. No. For this case, I just uh, started to think that what if I pick 1, 4, it would have some 5. So the third element would be n minus 5. This is not divisible by 3. This is not divisible by 3. And this one is not divisible by 3. So yeah, this pattern also worked out. And I just got two cases that if n is too large, then if it is divisible, I will just sorry if it is not divisible i will just pick up one two and n minus three if it is divisible i would pick up one four and n minus five now talking about the problems which can happen in this if n becomes small this would uh, never be divisible by three this would never be divisible by three this would never be and the same goes for these numbers but the problem which can happen is with either n minus three becoming less than or equal to 0 or uh, n minus 3 becoming equal to either 1 or 2. So you see that if n is 4 or 5, this will fail. And for all n is less than or equal to 3, it will again fail. Uh, either one of these conditions will be true there. So we can say that, hey, this case of picking up 1, 2 and n minus 3 is true for all n is greater than 5. Or you could just manually um, so, check uh, it also. Uh, yeah. Can you just repeat uh, from here? N1, analyzing this part, 1 to N minus 3. Okay. So what I said was that if you are going to pick up something like 1 to N minus 3, you see that uh, the elements will never be divisible by 3. This is something we came up with. And the only way, like the only reason why this triplet might fail is because if n minus 3 is 
negative is becoming like non positive or if it becomes equal to either of these two elements as we have been told that we have to keep uh, elements which are distinct so that condition would break and both of the conditions we see that if n is greater than 5 then none of those conditions is happening so you saw that this pair will always be true for all n is greater than 5 and n not divisible by 5 or n not divisible I'm, by 3 i'm not getting this means how n greater than 3 i'm getting this part n minus 3 less than equal to 0 you see that if n is greater than 5 we will never have a problem no? and this part i'm saying that if n is like 1 2 or 3 in both of these conditions you cannot have a pair like 1 2 and n minus 3 uh, don't think of it as coding just uh, try to use some common sense here not coding like just forget about coding right now for this kind of thing yeah but i'm not getting this part and how you thought of n greater than n should be greater than 5 i just got it because i knew that n can not be greater than less than or equal to 3 i got it because i know that i have to keep them positive and i got it that n cannot be equal to like n minus 3 cannot be equal to 1 and n minus 3 cannot be equal to 2 so n cannot be equal to 4 or n cannot be equal to 5 right okay, it cannot okay. be equal to these elements it cannot be equal to 4 okay. or it cannot yeah, be equal to 5 yeah, yeah. so it will be true for all the values greater than uh, 5 yeah right and for the other case in a similar way uh, the other case you see 1 4 and n minus 5 it is pretty much similar and even for giving hint they took uh, n equal to 9 in the test cases that it will fail if either n minus 5 is less than equal to 0 which will be happening only if n is less than equal to 5 so we will ignore all those cases and when uh, if you can just see that when n is equal to 6 in that case it is equal to 1 basically you didn't want n minus 5 to be equal to 1 so you got that n should not be equal to 6 and n minus 5 should not be equal to 4 also so here you can here you got that n should not be equal to 9 so here you can say that in it should be n is greater than 7 and not equal to 9 after just compiling all the observations we have got you can see that for all the numbers from 1 to 6 it will have a no it will have a no for 9 it will have a no these are the cases where it will have a no for all the other cases you will just check if n is divisible by 3 or not so if n is not divisible by 3 just print up 1 2 and n minus 3 if it is divisible by 3 if n is divisible by 3 in that case you can just say 1 4 and n minus 5 so does anybody have any doubt in this Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to ask like uh, these type of questions are generally encountered or is it a unique one? You will generally see like you will see this kind of problems a lot of times. And it's uh, making some equal to some number under some constraint. Uh, basically just observation. This is just observational problem. In this kind of problems, uh, you don't really uh, need to have much knowledge of coding you just need to use some common sense and uh, try to find patterns these are the two things you should be focusing mainly and not much of coding like you see that there was at that uh, if you talk about coding it is just having if else conditions like in the code you will see yeah it's only if else in the code, it is just having some methods conditions that if it is less than equal to 6, return no. If it is equal to 9, return no. Uh, if it is not divisible by 3, then you can say that, uh, first of all, we have got an answer, so you will say yes. And print the pattern, which is just 1, 2, and n minus 3. 
And in case if it is divisible by three, then you will say one, four, and n minus five. It might have some more patterns, but this is the first one I saw. And surprisingly, I got it faster than Jiangli. Though obviously this is not an achievement, but it happened with me for the first time, I guess. Congrats. No, it's not something with congrats. Uh, it's not something with mentionable though. Just give it up. Okay, so the second problem we have, it tells us that, uh, where is it? So in the second problem, there is a graph. You have point O at the origin. You have point P somewhere. Point P somewhere, like not necessarily in the first quadrant. It can be anywhere. And you can have a point A and a point B. Again, uh, they can be anywhere on the plane, uh, but they won't coincide with each other. They would be uh, like, they would be at some distance from each other, uh, not at the same place. Now we have been told that you want to go from O to P, but you can only travel in light and these A and B are actually lantern, whatever you want to boost, uh, lanterns. So these are lanterns which will give some light, I guess. It was something like this, yes. Yeah, so there is darkness which they would be removing. It would be something like this. And the radius of these two circles, A and B, would be equal to W. So uh, what we are being given in a nutshell is we are being given the coordinates of the point A, the point B, and the point P. And we have to tell some radius W, the lowest possible value of W, the lowest possible value of W such that uh, if you just move on in the region of the circle, you can go from the point O to point P. So is the problem clear? Please say yes or no. Is the problem clear? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, fine. So by just looking at the problem, I got three cases in my mind. Case one, for going from point O to point P, if I just travel across the area of point A, right, if, uh, sorry, in the circle A. So if I'm just uh, going across the area of circle A and I'm able to go to the place, it can be the most optimal case in case if the point B is very far away, something like that. Case two can be valid. Let's say from point O to point P, this route is coming close to the point B. It can come in the area of point B. Obviously, it won't be the circle won't be this large. It would be having uh, at least one of the points at the circumference. But in just the case can be something like this, where the A point is too far and P point is close. So just go from point O to point P through the circle B. And in the case three, what can happen is maybe the point A, point B are at some distance and one of them is having point O at his circumference and uh, sorry, make this off. Make this okay. Maybe something like this, the point A, the point B, point O and point B, something like this. Like you can have a case like this as well. And the fourth case will just have it in the opposite way that point A, point B, A having point B and B having point O at its circumference, something like this. Uh, Let's see it once again in case if somebody didn't get what I was showing. 
what I said was that if I have, let's say I found the, let's say, let's say I found the uh, smallest value of O, smallest value of W, and uh, now when I draw the circles with that radius, now the possible cases can be something like this. And if I draw it properly, it would be like this. From point O to point P somewhere. That both the points O and P are just lying in the uh, area of the circle A. And similarly, uh, the other thing can happen that they are being lying, they are lying in the area of point area of circle B. So it is lying inside circle B. Sorry, circle A. Yeah. Lying inside circle B. Here in the third case, I said that they are lying. in both circles and in the fourth case as well. So does this make sense? Please say yes or no, that does this make sense? That in the optimal answer, you will definitely be having something like this. Right? Yeah, we would have something like this only that uh, the points would be some uh, having uh, a relation like this. Now for the first case, if both the points are inside the radius, are inside the area of uh, point A. Yeah, we will be coming to uh, last two cases also. But for the first and second case, it can be either like this, that for O to be like whichever is closer, Whichever is closer will be inside the circle and whichever is uh, further will be at a distance W. Basically, I will just find the distance of A to P and the distance of A to O and say that which one is whichever is larger, I can just have that as my W. So in that case, I will have both of them inside my circle. I've got one value for W that at least even if I take this, then I will definitely get an answer. I know. Now I will just check the same thing for B also. That what will what is the requirement of B, the radius of B? That what is the distance from B to P and what is the distance from B to O? Whichever is larger, I will just put it inside another W. Uh, let's call it as W1. W2. Then in the third case, I can say that I know if I had to get my optimal answer by putting both of them together in any of the circles, I would have got my answer. If I'm still not getting my answer, it might be because one of them is connected to A and one of them is connected to B. So it can be a case like this O and P or maybe the other way around that here we have P and here we have O, that is, in this case, we will be having the value of W as the maximum of this guy, the maximum of this guy, and the maximum of this by two, because it is also possible that uh, A and O are very close to each other, let's say, Let's say if you have a case where A and O, sorry, A and O are very close to each other and B and P are very close to each other, but these are very away. Okay, so what part do you want me to repeat? Last third case, third and fourth one. Okay, third case. Okay, let me just do it once again. We saw one thing. If both the points are lying very close to A and B is far away. You could just 
choose the larger distance as w to get both of them both of the points in the circle of a and this would be our most optimal answer in this case right this was the case one similarly we have case two where both of the points will be very close to b now for the case three what we found was that what if one point is close to a any of the points either o or p and the second point is very close to p uh, very close to b the other one whichever it was like if it is a o on the left then b p on the right or p on the left and o on the right now you might have to choose your w as half of the radius which is like sorry distance of a b by 2 distance of centers of a b by 2 you might have to draw circles of that much radius so in this case in this kind of case where uh, this stuff is happening your answer like your w would be the distance of uh, distance of points between a and b distance of a and b by 2 because both of them will have w w radius so q into w will be equal to this radius or you could have a case where a and b are not too away from each other but this o and p are a little at a, like are at such a distance that if you pick up some value you will have some intersection in a and b and all the points will lie there in that region so this case will happen if like in this case the best answer would be to just find the distance find the max of distance of a to o and distance of b to p right in this kind of case like this might be your answer this might also be your answer and if you again um, obviously, I am telling just the cases one by one because I also spend time on my own. You also need to spend some time on your own to uh, try to discover more and more cases which can follow and just see which in which category in which category they will fall. Broadly, there were mainly two cases. Either you fit both of them in one circle. Either if it uh, both of the points O and P in any of the circles of A or B, or you choose some W such that your O point or P point is lying at one circle and the other one is lying at other another circle. For this, you just saw that the answer can be set as the minimum of like minimum big okay, not say minimum. If that circle you choose to be A, then it would be best of a to O and this of A to P to cover both of them. You will be just taking the maximum of them. If you want the A circle to cover both of them, similarly for B circle, it would be just maximum of this of B to O and the maximum of distance of B to P. And uh, you will just take the minimum. Like you will always take the minimum of all the cases you we'll see later on. In the next case, you can have, in this case, uh, as uh, picking up A and O, like having a the circle A containing O and circle B containing P and A and B should be connected with each other. So A and B should be connected with each other. Just the maximum of all these. Similarly, uh, now just interchanging A and B. So the maximum of distance of B and O, distance of A and P, distance of A and B by two. Just taking the maximum of all these. Hannah. And now you see that this is one way of getting some W to connect all, like connect the path from O to P. 
this is another way this is another way and this one is another way you can pick up any of them so you will definitely pick up the way in which you get the minimum cost which means that you will just pick up the minimum of all of them now pick up the minimum of all of them now okay so does this make sense we just generated all the cases and after that we just took the maximum of all of them for generating the cases we try to come across all the possible uh, circumstances which could which could happen that what if one of the circles is having both of the points with each other with itself what if a and b are way too apart from each other what if a and b are not too apart but a point is uh, at a distance uh, last case diagram uh, do you want me to explain this one this one how you generalize three cases in this one case only can you please explain it some better uh, these are not actually three different cases it is that if you want to have point O lying in circle A, point P lying in circle B, and obviously A and B should be connected with each other because you want to go from O to P. If they are not being, if the circles are not being connected to each other, you won't be able to go from O to P. So A and B should also be connected. Right. Now for the cost of uh, connecting O and A should be this. Connecting B and P is this. And connecting A and B is this. Just taking this cost. Uh, now let's say that A and O are very close to each other. But B and P are not. At the end, we will be having the radius as the maximum requirement. So that's why we have been taking the maximum. Okay, so should we uh, move on? Like, let's move on. Uh, to the hello? Board. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, we can solve the problem using binary search also. Binary search on answer. Um, yep. We ah, I have done that. Yes. Yeah, we can. But uh, like, even during the contest, I felt that about applying binary search on the answer but it was something like overkilling the problem so oh, okay. i just went on it like i just felt that it would be something like overkilling uh, but it will be basically log n only no because uh, searching also we are doing finding distance that is basically square root n yeah and log n uh, so typically it's log n only uh, uh, by overkilling i mean that we have been applying some concept without which it can be solved Though it is uh, better to apply binary search. Uh, there are might, so many edge cases, right? That's why. You I, might I, miss I, up a case somewhere. So uh, if it doesn't come to your mind directly in one go, it is better to apply binary search. Uh, my implementation is a little bit complicated. Not very complicated, but some people might feel it complicated because I try to keep everything in it and later on just take the square root. But the approach which I discussed, it is the same. What I did was just find out the distance between everything. Like distance between A to O, distance between A to P, distance between B to P, distance between B to O, and distance between A to B. After finding all of these, I said that for the first case, it is just the maximum of AO and AP. For the second case, it is just the maximum of BO and BP. For the third case, uh, the part become complicated here because I cannot directly divide the element by two or two since it is integer right now. And that's why I multiplied these numbers by four to take the maximum and divide. Basically, you can do it in uh, with double, and that's why I have 
having the English implementation right now, coded at 10 double. Uh, this is a very clean code also that you just take up all the inputs. After that, you can, uh, you have this case where you are just taking the maximum of O and AP, A, O and AP. You take the maximum of BO and BP. So here it is, BO and BP. You take the maximum of A to O, B to P, and A to B by 2, uh, like this. And similarly, this case also. And for finding the distance between two points, uh, there is a function in STL, I thought that uh, basically just give out the absolute differences and it will return you the hypothesis. Hypothesis. Forgot the word actually. Okay, so is this clear? Mine is a little uh, longer and having some unnecessary stuff here because I kept everything in it. And I would recommend you to use law uh, double only. Okay, so should we move on to the third problem? Let's move on to the third problem. The third problem says that you will be given um, consider a sequence of S1, S2, SN. Like there is a sequence of S1 to SN where it is like this. Let me show you. You will be given S1 and you can generate S2 to SN on your own it would be like this that let's say if s1 is b a c d s2 will be the string with uh length uh which can be generated by deleting exactly one element from s1 so uh s1 delete exactly one element from s1 exactly one element from S1 and uh, S2, like for all the strings which can be created by doing this, S2 should be the smallest possible one. S2 should be the smallest possible string. So that's what we have to do. And after that, S3 will again be formed in similar way that one element of S2 would be deleted and the resulting S3 would be the smallest possible string which can be created by doing this stuff. And so on till S of n. In S of n, there will be just one element left. So if you delete this, there will be an empty string. That's why there is no point of going to S of n plus one. Now what we are doing what we are saying is that you will be having s equal to s1 plus s2 plus s3 and so on till s of n. You will be having such a string. This string is not actually, you don't really have to create it because the length of s1 was n, the length of s2 will be s of like n minus 1, n minus 2 and so on. The length of s will become n into n plus 1 by 2 which you cannot really create to be uh, n is less than equal to 25. This is very large. But from the string, you will be given a query. Uh, you will be given an integer pose. You will have to tell which element comes at the position. So basically, you will have to say, you will have to return s of pose. Where you don't have the string, you have to create it somehow. Uh, you have to create somehow, find this position, not create it. You cannot create it. Uh, your message is quite long and it is the which I will read it after the session. Now at this point, this thing should be very obvious that you cannot really create this complete S. You cannot create S. 
you cannot create us. But one thing you can do is that, uh, like maybe if n was something like four, which means that s one would be of length four, s two would be of length p, s three would be of length two, and s one would be of length. Sorry, s four will be of length one. I know. These would be the lengths of the strings. Maybe if pos is equal to seven, or let's take it to be uh, nine for now. In that case, you see, uh, by the way, this position is in one based indexing. One based indexing. So here you can see one thing for sure. If pos is greater than four, since pos is greater than four. It would never be coming from string one. You know, the portion you see that S is having some concatenation of some strings, concatenation of some strings. So you have to search for nine. You know that this portion is just having four elements. So this nine would not be coming from this. Now in this remaining portion you have, you want to search for the fifth element, right? This is how you could reduce the problem. You see that this is having a length of three, this string, and you have to search for the fifth element. So again, you can say that this five won't be coming from this size. Now you have to search for two in this remaining substring. You see that this substring is having size two. So uh, you can know now know that since your position, since your pause is less than the length of this i. Uh, not I, but basically the length of the third string. Now you can you can say that you have to search for an element which is in the string three. You have to, to be honest, search for S three pause. The third, like the second element in the string S three. Now, will you really create this S three? Though you can create it. Uh, creating S three is not hard, but one thing you could do was whatever string you had, let's take an example of A, B, C, A, D, something like this. You could just find out that which element would be removed for, while going from S1 to S2, which would be removed while going from S2 to S3, which would be removed while going from S3 to S4, and so on. How will you find it? Uh, this is kind of standard. And like even this problem of deleting some some elements from S3 is also standard. Uh, you can even search on internet and you will find a GFG article, something like uh, string, lexicographically minimum string basically, lexico, lexicographically minimum string. After deleting exactly key elements. Now the problem has been the problem which you had has now been simplified to this problem, which is a standard problem actually. Like you can even find a GFG link for this problem. Uh, by saying standard, I mean that it is something only implementation based, and you can even find it on the internet. But just giving you some hints, like I'm giving you hints and not giving the proper explanation. If you want proper explanation, you can refer to this article on internet. What we do, uh, if you want to go from S1 to S2, you will see that removing this one is not giving me any benefit. So you would not remove it and you will have it in S2. Then you go to this D element. You see that if you don't take this, it does not again give you, you any benefit. You can have it. Enough. When you talk about the C element, uh, let's say that what if we pick it? Let's say if we pick it in our S2. Then when you will come to A, you will see that this A is smaller than the previous element. So if this previous element never existed, your string could have been like this. Enough. So. Uh, this is actually the idea behind it that you will 
search for the first element. You will search for the first element, which is larger than the next element. Larger than the next element. And which are, whichever element you see, which is larger than the next element, or in case if there is no la no element like this, you will just remove the last element. Or if you find an element which is larger than the first than the next element, just remove it. Because removing it is making the string smaller. In this case, when you had A B C A B, removing this is making the string smaller. A B A B. But if you had removed this A. You would have got it. You would have got the string even worse. If you had removed the string element B, you would have again had got the string even worse. This C was the first element removing which was getting the string better. Now let's say if you didn't do this. Now whatever you do after this, you are still having the C here. While removing it would have gave you A, and this string will definitely like always be larger smaller than all the strings you have after this point because the first element where you get the difference is what matters for deciding the lexicographically minimum element okay so everything has been fine till now we know how to go from s1 to s2 you have to remove the first element which is larger than the next element for going to s2 to s3 you have to remove the second element, which would be larger than the next element. I know. But here, there is one catch. Once you remove C, now B is the first element, which is larger than the next pair. So you would have to remove B. After that, you would see that this is the last pair, which uh, since there are no elements which are larger than next, so this B will be removed, then A, then A. Uh, the basic idea is that you can use a stack to maintain the stuff, you will push stuff like A, B, C. Then when you try to push A, you see that A is smaller than the last element. So you will pop it out and you will see that this would be removed first. Then you will see that hey, A is still larger than B, which is the top element of stack. So this B would also be removed and it would be given the index to that it would be removed at position 2. Now you see that A is not smaller than A. So this would not be removed. After that, you would add B to the stack. Later on, since the string has been processed, you would start removing elements. Remove this, remove this, remove this. This is how we proceed. Uh, again, reminding that what I was giving, what I was doing was giving you some hints to proceed, not actually going on for the complete explanation. Uh, since the motive behind PCD is to teach you how to think about stuff and really teaching you algorithms. Now, what I did for the problem was that if I have a string like A, B, C, A, B, in that case, I would give it the index, give it an element uh, value 5, which means that for all the strings with length 5 or greater, this would exist. Then this element was being removed, so I gave it a 4. That for all the strings with length 4 or greater, this would be present. For this B, I gave it 3, then 2 here, and then 1 here. After that, what I did was to just, uh, whatever string you had, you know that starting, like the starting N elements positions would be covered by S1, then N by 2 by S2. Sorry, n minus 1 by s2, then n minus 2 by s3, and so on. You have this position element, which would be at most n into n plus 1 by 2. So I just have to, like, I just, I can just run up a for loop for n size. And just check if this position can come in this string or not. If this can come, then it's good. If it cannot come, then I will just remove it directly. You know that you have from S1, S2 till S1 only. So the maximum iterations you will have is going to be big of n, in order of big of n, the maximum complexity for this part. Whenever you find any string, let's say you found string S of 8 out of S of 8. You found 
uh, that string s of a is the string in which this position would be lying. Now I can just say that for the initial string which I was being given, I had marked the elements. For every element, I had given it some number that uh, as we saw for a, b, c, a, b, I had marked it five that for all the strings with length five or greater, all the strings with length four or greater and so on. I can find the length of this string very easily. This string has length n, the next would have n minus one and so on till this one would have n minus seven maybe. Uh, minus one plus one, yeah, n minus seven. So for all the elements with uh, whatever values I give, I just name the array as order. So for all the indices where order of i is greater than this uh, length of the string, let's say the length of the string is ln, ln for now. So if it is greater than length, or maybe let's call it as left. So if it is greater than left, I know that this element would have already been removed and I can skip it directly. Otherwise, I will just reduce the value of position while iterating over the string. At some point of time, post will be equal to zero. That index would be my answer. Like that character on that index would be my answer. Okay, so does this make sense? Or in case if you have doubt at some place, then please tell it. Which part did you not understand? Okay, so this numbering part. So for this numbering part, what I have been doing, you can just take it like this. I know A, B, C, A, B, or let's take some other example in this instance, C, A, B. Let's just take this C, A, B example as from the test cases. What do you think? Which element would be removed first? If this is, like if S1 is C, A, B, what would be S2? Yeah, C would be removed and it would become A, B. Then S3 would be A. So what I'm doing is just with the help of a star, I'm just finding the indices, uh, just finding the character which would be removed first. So I found that C would be removed first. I created an array. I see that its index is, uh, for, let, for now, let's take one best indexing. Uh, for now, we are just taking one list indexing because we have taken poses one list. So you will just say that order of one is one. C is being removed first. Then you see that this element, this B is going to be removed later on. So you will say that order of three, like the index, the index is three, is two. Then this element would, would be removed. So order of two is three. Now, uh, since I know that like this part is not necessary. Even if you don't do this, you can just make some changes in the implementation at other part and still do the job. What I did here was that uh, instead of storing them as one, two, three, instead of so storing these elements as one, two, three here, I did store them as three, two, one. So order of two equal to three, order of, sorry, order of, uh, maybe let me write it again. Order of one is three. Instead of storing it as one, I stored it as three, two for two, and instead of three, it was one. Just in the reverse order. Because uh, earlier this order I was, the meaning behind this order I was when would it be removed? At what number would it be removed? Now the new meaning of this order is that all SI with 
length greater than order i length greater than order i or even equal to greater than or equal to order i will contain the character on uh, ith index will contain the character on ith index this is what uh, the meaning of this order of i is now and it just helped me that i don't have to say something like n minus order at some place instead i just use the order basically implementation is something you can uh, do it in any way it is not the only way of doing so don't focus much on implementation the basic idea behind the problem was just this much that you can find in which string this pose will come by com uh, just reducing the value of pose and going through this after knowing which position you could just delete k elements k elements to find the lexicographically minimum string delete k elements to find the lexicographically minimum element uh, like minimum string after deleting key elements and from that string you just have to pick up the element at the index pause so this was the idea behind doing the problem now for the implementation i explained you the way i did implement it but you can like feel free to choose any way of implementing okay so should we move on to the code part okay so starting on just taking the inputs after that i used to start to just uh, find that order array. Uh, this portion is sorry. This portion is for just finding the order array which I created. After that, I found the uh, length of the substring in which uh, I will be having the position. And since I had created the order i in terms of length itself, uh, I just could I could just run up a for loop to find that element. Now the reason I'm not explaining this code line by line is because you can have different ways of implementation. It's uh, just useless to look at someone else exact implementation. So shall we end the session? Okay, great. Have a good day.